Hello and welcome once again to our weekly Fronius webinar. Today we shall be presenting zero feeding and net metering uh, with Fronius Inverters. And to do this with me today is, of course, my colleague, Mohamed Sidat, who is a technical sales advisor for Southern Africa. He is with Fronius South Africa. And then, of course, myself, Cipran Okolo, the technical sales advisor for Western Africa. So um, let's now delve directly into the agenda for today. We shall be putting you through some uh, introductory phases. Uh, we shall go through the basics of feeding and net metering, look at the required components to achieve this, and then answer the question, why feed-in limitation? Of course, we'll be looking at installation and commissioning. Afterwards, my colleague Mohammed Sidat will be continuing uh, with uh, giving you how this can be achieved with the use of uh, input output ports uh, using PV system controllers or controller. And then uh, you would now have a live demo. We'll take us through a live demo and of course give us uh, further information. So without further ado, let's now get into it uh, with a bit of an introduction. So where else to start from than a standalone system, which uh, obviously is um, a DC coupled system where we have um, a DC power being stored in a battery, of course, uh, via a charge controller. And then uh, the inverter transforms the DC into AC power. But uh, usually in this case, uh, there's a need for extra energy sources like a gen set or windmill to supply for um, extra energy needs coming emanating from uh, heavier loads like the washing machine, um, AC power, or even generation of hot water. And then now uh, we'll take a look at the grid connected system. In this case, uh, we have uh, uh, the, pro the produced AC power from the grid, uh, from the PV is synchronized to the grid, which is then subsequently uh, fed into uh, the grid via a grid meter. As you can see in this simple setup with a Fronius uh, snap inverter, with a grid meter uh, via which um, surplus energy is fed into the grid. Of course, we could have a PV hybrid system where we have a DC and AC power, in such cases, we have a surplus DC power stored in the battery for later use, maybe at night or otherwise. And then, of course, uh, the surplus power, surplus AC power generated can, of course, be fed into the grid. And uh, for continuing, let's uh, give you a brief of um, uh, how the uh, feeding or uh, brief information of uh, general uh, feeding scenarios. Uh, first off, we have full feeding and uh, surplus feeding. Okay, I'm getting that uh, some of you can't hear me. I want to believe that uh, it might be from your end, but then if you if you can hear me, please uh, give me a hand, as in raise, raise your hand, so that uh, we'll be sure that uh, you can uh, hear and see. Uh, the screen uh, clearly. Thank you. So continuing with uh, the presentation, uh, we have full feeding and surplus feeding. For full feeding, it's uh, usually a peculiar uh, situation where you have uh, two grid meters, uh, where you have uh, one connected to the load and then the other connected to the PV generator via the inverter, the PV inverter. So in such case, uh, you have that um, the grid is sort of uh, has a dedicated line of supply and uh, has a specified power that has to be uh, that has to be uh, injected into the grid before uh, the load uh, can take it or can be supplied. So in this case, um, it's safe to say that uh, the grid is sort of uh, prioritized, and uh, we have surplus feeding. So in this case, uh, this is one the one we are mostly used to. Okay, so it's good to understand that um, well, most of you, or almost all of you, uh, can actually hear me clearly and uh, see my slide. Good, so continuing, we have a surplus feeding, and uh, in this case, uh, it's something we're used to. So this is where uh, the load is uh, sort of uh, prioritized, meaning that uh, the load, unless you are generating more than you are consuming, then the surplus can now be injected into the grid. 
um, sometimes or preferably, or for example, called a net metering. So uh, looking at uh, the required components, it's uh, basically uh, your snap inverter with, of course, the data manager. Um, of course, you would need the data manager to be able to connect to the smart meter and uh, be able to uh, effect uh, feeding uh, limitation. Uh, for the Gen 24 Plus and the Taro inverters, these are latest products. They are all they all have integrated in them uh, the pilot, which is the data communication uh, equivalent of the data manager. Of course, as mentioned earlier, you will need a smart meter to be able to effect uh, feeding limitations. Good. So continuing. Uh, just to give you a brief on uh, the Pronia smart meter. And um, we have them in single phase, three phase, and uh, um, three phase commercial. We have them in single phase for residential system, three phase also for residential system, and then uh, three phase for commercial uh, usage. Um, we have a dedicated webinar for smart meters. So I would recommend that uh, you visit our website or YouTube channel and then uh, you know watch uh, these uh, particular webinars so to get more insight on the smart meters. So why feed in limitation? Um, in most cases, you have that uh, grid operators uh, tend to limit feed in power uh, from uh, the uh, PV generators so as to avoid uh, overpopulation. And uh, of course, you have cases where the customers um, liking to uh, increase or supply high power loads um, by their own PV power. So this would of course mean that uh, it's either they want to uh, supply enough to kind of charge their EV, for example, or supply for um, heavier loads, um, including um, generating of hot water, washing machine, uh, cookers, uh, air conditioners, and the likes. So this would in turn uh, have them uh, expanding their PV capacity and then of course with the usage of a smart meter be able to feed into the grid and at the same time supply for their expanded or increased load. So taking a look at an example of how this can be achieved, uh, this is um, a diagrammatical expression of uh, what it could look like. So we have a 10 kilowatts peak uh, PV system and uh, connected to an 8.2 uh, Frenius SIMO. And then, uh, of course, we have a Frenius smart meter connected at the feeding point, uh, of course, connected to the uh, energy meter, your grid meter. And then, uh, of course, you have your load all tied to the same AC output bus bar. So in this case, for example, we have a feed in uh, five kilowatts feed in limitation um, implemented. So this is um, uh, um, sort of an example of how it could look like. And then taking this as an example, we can now look at uh, how it would look like in, from our solar web uh, data. So from what we can see here, the portion or region uh, colored um, dark gray is uh, the power consumed by uh, the client or the consumer per se. And then uh, the portion in green uh, shows the power fed into the grid. So with the five kilowatts uh, feeding limitation implemented, as can be seen in the previous slide, uh, it ensures that um, you don't go beyond five kilowatts uh, being fed into the grid. So in this case, you have all your energy needs um, met by the PV generation. And then of course, you have a substantial amount being fed into the grid, which of course uh, generates uh, uh, income. So, um, that's one way to look at it. Uh, another way to look at it is in terms of um, a higher self-consumption, uh, in this case, using an example of an EV charger. So say we have uh, an installation, uh, say five kilowatts peak installation with an EV charging power of seven kilowatts. Um, this obviously means that um, the PV generation uh, wouldn't be enough to supply for all or the entire need of this particular EV charging power. So let's say it's about um, this time, uh, the EV kicks in, the EV charging kicks in. And then of course, since it's uh, way higher than the 
uh, PV generated. Uh, it has to get the other um, charging power from the grid, as we can see. So what can be done in this case? Well, the best uh, scenario is to add another five kilowatts uh, peak PV generation to make it 10 kilowatts. Uh, of course, with the same EV charging power of seven kilowatts. So now what happens in this case? With a five kilowatt uh, feeding limitation implemented, we can now see an improved uh, self-consumption rate. So here you can see that the PV, once it kicks in at about, uh, say, 2 p.m., the PV is able to cater for the energy need of the EV charging. And then just a small portion is uh, taken from the grid to achieve a full charge of the EV. So this, of course, is uh, where feeding uh, limitation can actually um, help to boost um, self-consumption. So um, looking at another scenario in terms of uh, commercial PV. So for this example, we have um, eight units of uh, 25 Echo 25s uh, connected. So this gives us 200 kilowatts peak. Uh, this, of course, uh, just a diagrammatic representation of the eight inverters. And then this um, red line represents that uh, it's a solar net ring. So we have all eight inverters uh, interconnected uh, using the solar net ring. And then, of course, in this case, you just need one master um, inverter, which that is the, an inverter that has a data manager. So the rest can be light inverters that is without data managers. So that is enough to serve in terms of a communication and implementation of this feed implementation. So this data manager, of course, via the mode bus uh, channel uh, communicates with the Sophronia smart meter, which is, of course, connected to the grid meter on the feeding point. So for this particular situation, you can have, uh, for example, a feeding limitation of 100 kilowatts um, implemented. So meaning that uh, you can supply um, for all your energy needs for the consumption points, and then of course also feed into the grid with this feeding limitation uh, capacity um, being implemented. Okay. So uh, please keep your questions coming. My colleague. Uh, Mohamed Sidat will be attending to them as they come. Um, going to the next slide, um, we're going to now be looking at uh, the advantages of this feeding control. It is usually said that um, the power is nothing without control. So by the time you're able to effect uh, um, a control uh, that is feeding control, you have uh, the possibility of uh, generating higher PV power. Uh, being confident that you'll be able to control it and uh, use it uh, to the best of um, ability. And then, of course, uh, this also leads to faster ROI. And then, of course, uh, you're able to reduce load peaks and avoid high peak uh, power costs. And um, in the case of um, EV charging, it is possible to supply EV chargers without any necessary change of um, cables in, or in terms of uh, cable dimension. So still the same circuit, circuitry would be able to accommodate this. And this is, of course, a very, very big advantage when it comes to EV charging. So um, yeah, let's take a look at the feeding limitation with battery systems. Um, this could be an example of a setup of uh, how a hybrid uh, setup could look like. So with our Phonios Gen 24 uh, plus hybrid inverter, uh, communicating with the smart meter and uh, having a feeding limitation of five kilowatts implemented, you can also have um, uh, an additional snap inverter with a five kilowatt peak, uh, combining with the five kilowatt peak being generated from the Gen 24 plus end. Uh, this can of course be used to charge the battery and then uh, once we have uh, supplied for all our energy needs, we can, of course, inject the rest into the grid, of course, uh, noting or implementing the five kilowatts feed-in limitation. So subsequent slides will show how you can actually uh, implement this. Uh, in the case where you would want to use a third party inverter, you would need a second smart meter so as to be able to capture the data uh, 
and then this so that uh, it can be able to be viewed via solar web. So let's now look at uh, uh, installation and commissioning. Um, in terms of the Fronia smart meter, um, also we might not spend much time on this. It's uh, basically straightforward. Uh, usually, uh, the supposed to be a 120 termination resistor. Um, that usually is the case for uh, old smart meters, but in this case, it is already integrated. All you need to do to activate it is to uh, loop uh, terminals three and five, that is for the single phase uh, smart meter, and then connect the data terminals to the mode bus terminal using uh, the respective uh, terminal connections, as can be seen for M0 plus and then M0 um, minus. Uh, the same thing applies for the data manager. The previous slide contained how you can do it with the pilot. So the next slide here includes how you can do it with the data manager. Uh, in this case, please ensure that the switch um, put the switch is put on the on position. The switch is actually located under or on the uh, next to the antenna depending on how you're looking at it. So, but for the three phase meter, the looping points should be terminal seven and nine. These are all contained in the smart meter um, presentation, uh, webinar presentation. So you can look that up on our YouTube channel. Uh, same thing applies for uh, smart meter, uh, the five kilo amp uh, type, that's for the commercial. Uh, the only difference is in this case, you would have to implement or use uh, current transducers or transformers to step down the current to a user-friendly uh, capacity or level for the smart meter to use. And then in this case, you'd have to loop terminals 10 and 12 to effect the 120 uh, ohms uh, termination resistance. Uh, if you don't implement this, there wouldn't be a closed communication loop and there will be no communication between the smart meter and the pilot or the data manager, depending on which of uh, the inverter you are using. So let's now go to data manager commissioning. So for data manager commissioning, uh, the data manager web interface can actually be accessed in two ways. That is uh, via the Wi-Fi access point and then via the LAN port. For the Wi-Fi access point, you would have to uh, activate the Wi-Fi access point in the data manager, and then connect your computer, tablet, or smartphone, depending on what you're using for monitoring, uh, to the specific Wi-Fi network of the inverter, and then open your web browser and then go to this IP address. For the LAN port, you have to connect it via the LAN cable to the data manager, and then uh, switch the data manager IP switch to position A, and then go to your web browser and use this IP address. Good. So this will take you directly to uh, the commissioning wizard. We recommend that you use the technician wizard. And then afterwards, it will bring you to this home page uh, where you would now select settings. This will now take you to the settings uh, pane. And then from here, you can select meter, uh, choose Fronia smart meter, and then indicate that you are connecting this meter on the feeding point by clicking on feeding point. If it's going to be connected on the consumption part, which of course is not treated in this case, in this particular presentation, you can now select consumption part. But for feed-in purposes, as is treated in this presentation, you select feed-in point. Then next up, you could now go to the dynamic power production and uh, select uh, limit for entire system. That is, if you want to implement feed-in limitation. And then you can now uh, put in your the power generated, the peak power generated from the peak, from the PV system. And then this is now the deciding point, because as you can see from this subtitle for this slide, it's a zero feeding configuration. So if you are not, if the if uh, the grid operators does not allow you to feed into the grid, so what you're going to set in here or put in here is zero. So this means that you will not inject any power into the grid. So, and then once that is done, please ensure that uh, you select dynamic power reduction as your first or highest priority. And then uh, you can have the IO control and then controlling via mild bus, via mode bus, taking the rest of the priority um, 
points. Please ensure that you click on this checkpoint to be able to save your settings. If you don't click on this checkpoint, your settings will not be saved. Good, so that's for zero feeding. Then for uh, dynamic uh, power reduction, that is in terms of uh, feeding, what you will need to do is at the same point, select limit for entire system. So in the case where you have uh, 7.5 kilowatts or 7,500 watts as uh, indicated here, you can now uh, program the amount of power that should be allowed to be fed into the grid. So in this case, we're going for 10% as indicated here. So it can either be in uh, exact figure or in percentage. So if it's in percentage, this automatically means that uh, we'll be injecting uh, 750 watts into the grid, nothing more. So, um, or you could either go in wattage and then type in 750, whichever case you choose is the same. So for dynamic power reduction uh, on the Gen24, it's actually also straightforward. Um, we also have a dedicated webinar on how to um, connect commission and uh, connect your um, Gen24 and um, commission your pilot. So it's actually going to be the same process. You go to general on your uh, settings pane, go to general, system overview, features and pins, and then go to dynamic power limit. Just the same process as uh, was done in the data manager's case. So you select the entire total DC injected by the system, that's for the PV generator, and then you can now select the power or the capacity that can be or should be fed into the grid, depending on the regulation set by the grid operators. So this is how you can also do so using the Gen uh, 24 inverter. So this uh, brings me to the end of my part of the presentation. So I will now be handing over to Mo, who will now continue uh, from this point. So Mo, uh, please do continue from here. Thank you. Thank you, Sipin. Okay, so before I start with my section, I would just like to launch a quick poll. I'd really appreciate if today's attendees could share their um, answers and feedback to this poll. Uh, but you should see the poll on your screen at the moment. Uh, the question is, which feeding setting do you enable the most on your PV installations? First one being zero feeding, second one limited feeding, and third one full feeding. So you can please go ahead and select one of those three answers. Okay, we'll be closing the poll in the next 10 seconds, so please do share your feedback. Okay, so I'd like to share the results. And we can see the majority of today's um, attendees, which are mostly PV installers, do install their PV systems and set it up for zero feeding. Okay, it does make a lot of sense because a lot of today's attendees are from the sub-Saharan African region where, as you all know, there is many limitations to where we can feed in and to where we can't feed in to the grid. Okay, this is followed up by some attendees who do limited feeding and last but not least those that are allowed and enabled to actually do full feeding. Okay back to the presentation. I will now take you through the next section which is called the unbalanced three-phase systems. Okay so I think the best way to explain this is uh, to give a problem and a sort of explanation of how a phonia system reacts to such a situation. Um, but yes, how is zero feeding achieved in unbalanced PV systems? So the problem you might have on site um, is that you have a three-phase unbalanced load 
whereby you cannot feed into the grid. So you need to achieve per phase zero feeding, okay? And let's just take an example for this system. We have a 15 kilowatt three phase Fronia Simo grid tide inverter with a Fronia smart meter installed. So the problem is that we have an unbalanced load connected to a PV system where we need to achieve per phase zero feed in. This term over here, per phase zero feed in, is very, very important because not many PV systems can achieve per phase zero feed in. Most of the PV systems on the market achieve net zero feed in, which might mean that you feed in onto phase one and you pull in onto phase two and you may be feeding onto phase three. Now, as you all know, some smart meters are very sensitive. and Even if you feed in onto one of the three phases, they will trip, okay? Which could cause your entire system to shut down. Okay, you also have some municipalities where if you feed in to a specific phase, um, those smart meters are not intelligent enough to detect feed in. They actually detect it as you pulling energy from the grid. So instead of, you know, cutting down your bill, you're actually increasing your bill. Um, so you just got to be careful whenever you have a three phase unbalanced load. Okay, but let's have a look and see how a Fronius um, system will react to a three phase unbalanced load when you have zero feed in setup. So when you cannot feed into the grid. Alley. So let's have a look at the load. Let's say the, the um, load on the first line is five kilowatts. The load on the second phase is four kilowatts and the load on the third phase is three kilowatts. So here you can see that we have an unbalanced load. And that is because each phase, the load drawn on each phase is different. So how will the system behave at full DC power availability? So let's say that this Fronia Simo inverter, which is a 15 kilowatt inverter, obtains 15 kilowatts worth of DC power through irradiation from the DC panels. The Fronius inverter will choose the weakest phase approach mode. Okay, so in this case, what is our weakest phase between these three phases? The weakest phase will be phase three, okay, which is three kilowatts. So this will mean that the Fronius inverter will throttle down to three kilowatts per phase, okay? So here you can see the Simo will go to three kilowatt output per phase. So what does this mean in terms of what are you feeding to the grid and what are you pulling from the grid per phase? So in the first phase on the grid, you will pull two kilowatts from the grid, because remember, my load on the first phase was five kilowatts. So if you take two kilowatts and add it to three kilowatts, you get five kilowatts, okay? The second phase, you will pull one kilowatt from the grid. So you take your one kilowatt from the grid, you add it to the weakest phase output on the SIMO, which is three kilowatts, and you get four kilowatts. The third phase, you will not pull anything from the grid, okay, because that is the weakest phase, and our inverter matches the weakest phase exactly for the zero feed-in scenario. So what's very important here is that we do not feed in power to any phase. Therefore, we can achieve zero feed-in per phase. What's very important to note is that this functionality of phase-dependent export with the weakest phase approach will only be available in the latest Fronius firmware. So the latest Fronius firmware for your data manager is 3.19.xx, and for the pilot card, it will be 1.13.xx. So if you have a Fronius system that's installed, and if you do not have the latest firmware updated, then your system will not do phase-dependent export with the weakest phase approach. Okay, so please do remember to always keep your firm, firmware updated to the latest version available. Okay, moving on to the next section, which is the use of I.O. ports. Zero feeding using I.O. ports. So why would you choose to use this method? So let's have a look at it, an example. If you have two AC sources, so let's say you've got a grid, a generator, and you are allowed to feed into the grid when available, and you're not allowed to feed into the jensen when available. Okay, this does make sense. You cannot feed into a generator because if you feed into a generator, you will damage the generator. Um, as long as your municipality allows, you can feed into the grid. Okay, so 
The problem in this specific situation is that we have two single phase four kilowatt motors on a farm. These are the only two loads connected to an eight kilowatt PV system, which is grid tied and also has a generator for the event of load shedding. You are allowed to feed in into the grid, but not feed in to the generator. Okay, as I said over there. You also cannot use a phone your smart meter as there are two AC sources, grid and genset, with two different conditions of feed in. Okay, remember, a phonius smart meter, you can only set one condition, okay? And that one condition is typically for the grid connection. Okay, so a phonius smart meter does not have enough space to add a second AC source, which in this particular scenario would be, would be your generator, okay? So if you have this sort of a situation where you are allowed to feed into the grid, but not allowed to feed into the genset, my recommendation is to, one of my recommendations is to use the IO inputs. And the solution to this is to take one 12 volt, normally closed relay, and connect it to the grid side. Whenever the grid is not available, then this contact will be closed, which will send a signal to the data manager or the pilot card, causing the system to throttle to a predefined value. In this case, we will throttle the inverter down to zero watts in the event that no motors are running to prevent backfeed to the generator. Once the grid is online, then the 12 volt, normally closed relay will close, and now we can run the inverter at 100%. So basically what's happening here in a nutshell is that whenever the generator is coming online, the PV inverter shuts down completely. So it goes down to zero watts. So this will make sure that we will never ever get feedback to the generator, irrespective of what our load is, okay? When the grid comes back online, our inverters will start up again, and then we will be able to, you know, feed into the grid and, you know, supply the loads with PV. Okay, so this is a very economical way to achieve a PV genset um, solution and incorporate a genset without necessarily, necessarily purchasing, you know, expensive PV controllers on the market. Okay, however, the disadvantage to this approach is that when your generator is running, your PV is completely switched off. Okay, so you're not really saving diesel um, per se. Yeah, how do you set this up? So how do you set this relay on a Fronius inverter? So you can hardwire a relay to the Fronius data manager or to the pilot card. And this relay can be triggered. And this can force the Fronius inverter to throttle down to a specific power value. So you can choose the power value. You can select zero watts, as we used in the example on the previous slide. Or you maybe can decide that, look, I only want to throttle my inverter down to 2000 watts because I know what my base load is, and I know my base load will never ever, you know, change. For example, how do you connect this 12 volt relay to the um, Fronius data manager? So, here's a little screenshot of the orange plug on a Fronius data manager, and this is a diagram which shows exactly how your 12 volt input relay needs to be connected to the data manager. Okay, so you can basically use I/O port one to nine. Okay, on the um, data manager. And what's important to note is that obviously your relay will be powered by, um, or well, will be connected on the grid side, okay? However, you've got a 12 volt signal on this section of the relay. And using this, you can determine whether you want your contact to be normally closed or normally open. And we will get into a bit of detail in the next slide. Okay, so once you physically wire up your relay, you then need to go to the I/O mapping of the web user interface of the inverter and activate the port you will use. So in this example, we're going to use port four, okay, which is pin four. So as you saw on the previous slide, I connected the relay to pin four on my on each plug on my data manager. We then need to activate this on the web user interface of the inverter. So you go to I/O mapping, you then go to I/O control four, and you then select pin four. Once you've done that, you then need to go to the DNL editor and do the required settings on the port for power limitation. So you then go to DNL editor. You then go to IO control. Okay, you then select either one of these blocks. I'm just selecting this row, okay. I will then go to pin four, which is this pin over here. And remember I said earlier, we're setting this to be open pin, okay? So normally open. 
Okay. I then select that as a normally open bin. Okay. And I'm basically saying that whenever the grid goes away, okay, my pin will basically be open. Okay. And this will cause the power output of the PV inverter to go to 0% in order to prevent backfeed to the generator. Okay, remember my example earlier on, I said that when the grid goes down, I want the generator to be started up, but I want the PV not to be started up. So the PV needs to go to zero watts. Okay, and in this case, it will go to 0%. Once you've done that, you then need to click on the tick and your setting is now set. Okay, so this basically means that when the grid goes down, the inverter will throttle to 0%. And when the grid comes back online, the inverter will go back to 100%. So back to the original operating value. Okay, moving on to the next section, which is um, how to use a PV controller for um, net metering or zero feed-in. Okay, the question is, why do you need to use a PV controller for you know, net metering or zero feed-in? One of the main reasons is that if you have two AC sources, so let's say you've got the grid and you have a generator, but what's a bit different to using an IO um, control, which you saw in the previous section, is that in this specific scenario, you want to keep your EV inverters online when your generator is online. Okay. The reason being is that you want to save diesel costs. Okay. So let's say you have an installation where the diesel generator is used for a good proportion of the day. And it doesn't make sense to be switching off your PV inverters every day for six or seven hours in order to prevent back to your genset. If you want to prevent that, you just get the PV controller. And with the PV controller, you do not need to switch your PV inverters to zero percentage or to zero watt output. Okay, you can basically enable your PV inverters to assist in saving diesel. So why would you use a PV controller? Whenever the generator comes online, but you want to still keep the PV running, then you need this controller to run the PV in the most optimum manner to save fuel and prevent backfeed to the generator. Okay, so here's a picture of the PV controller. And what the PV controller will do in a nutshell, it has two profiles. It has one profile for the grid, one profile for the generator. So let's say if you are allowed to feed into the grid when the grid is available, then you can set net metering on this meter. Or let's say if you're not allowed to feed into the grid, then you can also set zero feeding for the grid profile. For the generator profile, what you can do is, is that you can set a minimum genset running low. Okay, so maybe I decide that I want to make this generator run at a minimum load of 30%. Okay, remember a generator always needs to run at a specified minimum load. You can't run a generator too low because that will in fact cause the generator to use more fuel or it could damage the generator in the long run. Okay, this is why it's very important to always try and set your generator to run, to run at a minimum low. Okay, this controller will also detect what the load is, and based on what the load is, this controller can determine whether or not to increase your PV production or to decrease your PV production, and to try to keep the generator as close as possible to that minimum genset load. The Furnace PV controller does extremely fast regulation. Okay, so as I said earlier on, it does its regulation very quickly in order to achieve fuel savings, but also to protect the diesel generator in the case of potential back. So let's have a look at an at a, at a example. So let's say we have a load, and this load is running throughout the day, and all of a sudden there's a sudden drop in this load. Okay. Here we have the available PV and here we have the actual PV. This PV controller can detect this drop in load extremely quickly, less than two seconds. And in a very quick reaction time, it can throttle down the PV immediately to prevent any backfeed to the generator, as can be seen in this picture. When your load does pick up at the latter end of the day, um, it can also then increase your PV production but it can also increase the, the load at which the generator is running at. 
What I've done on this slide is that I've taken a screenshot of the web user interface of the Chrome SPV controller. And what is very important to note here is that we have two profiles. We have a profile for the main and we have a profile for the second. So this is what I said earlier on. With the Fronius PV controller, you can have two profiles for two AC sources. Okay, so my main source could maybe be, um, let's say, for example, be the grid. And my secondary source could maybe be the um, generator, okay, as an example. The next important terminology is what is the injection margin and what is the allowed injection? So the injection margin is the safety margin, okay? And basically what the safety margin is, it's a percentage value which you'll always pull from the grid or from the JSET irrespective of what the PV production is. The reason why you do set an injection margin is that if you have a very sensitive uh, municipality meter and whenever a big load drops, a certain feed-in could go to the grid. If you set an injection margin to a negative value, this will ensure that even if you have 50 or 20 watts feeding to the grid, the municipality meter will never trip because you'll always be pulling in enough power from the grid to offset the amount of power you're sending to the grid in the event of when a big load does drop off. What is allowed injection? Allowed injection is the percentage value that you will or will not be able to feed into the grid or to the chainsaw. Okay, when it actually comes to calculating the allowed injection, um, it's basically based off a calculation. And the way you do this calculation is that you take the power of your chainsaw minimum load over the total power of your PV inverter and you multiply that by a negative. Okay, so that would give you allowed injection. So in this case, I'm using an example, and I'm stating that I want my generator to run at a 30% minimum load in comparison to the inverter's power, okay? We have a 100 kilowatt genset, we have a 30 kilowatt PV system, and therefore, if you take 30% of 100 kilowatts, we're gonna get 30 kilowatts on the numerator. The denominator will be 30 kilowatts, because that's the size of the PV system, and if you multiply that by a percentage, we will get negative 100% as the allowed injection. So in this particular example, my main is my trend set and my secondary is my grid. So here we can see for the allowed injection, we have minus 100% on the generator. And this means that my generator should always run at a 30% minimum load. Okay. The next important setting is the injection margin, which is basically a safety factor which can be set to 3% per default. So as an example, a measured consumption of 60 kilowatts is now interpreted as 58.2. So if you take 3% of the consumption, which we take in at 60 kilowatts, that will work out to 1.8 kilowatts. So that means that there's always 1.8 kilowatts which is being pulled from either the grid or the genset. And as I said earlier on, it's basically a sort of a safety model. So let's have a look at some examples. So let's say we have an example values for main, which is your chance at operation, and secondary, which is zero feed in. So when you're not allowed to feed into the grid. So here we can see we have this zero percentage. Remember the secondary is our grid. And this means that we cannot feed into the grid. And for the main, which is the genset, the minus 100% is based off that calculation, which means 30% genset minimum load. So this will mean that the genset will always run at a 30% minimum load. The next example is when I want to do full feeding to the grid. So you can see the difference between zero feeding, we have 0%, and full feeding, we set that to 100%. Okay. The injection margin, 3%, that basically means that the system, whether it's operating on the generator or the grid, will always pull 3% of the consumption value from the grid or genesis. Okay, moving on, I will now take you through a quick live demo of a from your Snap Inverter. And in this live demo, all I'm going to do is show you how to set up zero feed in using a from your smart meter, which is already connected to a from your inverter. Okay, so here we have my from your system. So basically, what I've done is I've gone into the IP address of the from your inverter. Okay, I've then gone to settings, and once I've gone to settings, I then went on to meter, I connected my Chromium smart meter, okay, 
And once you've done that, you then need to go to DNO editor. Okay. I am now in the DNO editor. And what you need to do on the DNO editor, if you have a from your smart meter connected to your from your inverter, and if you want to set dynamic power reduction, you go to limit for entire system. And let's say that the total DC power of the system is 5,000 watts. And let's say I don't want to feed in anything to the grid. So what you need to do is that you need to set that to 0%. Once you've done that, you need to click on the tick, and that will basically mean that your Fronius grid type system will never feed in power to the grid because you set it to 0%. The next important thing you need to do is that you need to set the controlling priority. So you need to set timing power reduction to be the highest priority in the system. And once you've done that, you can then click on the tick. And that basically means that no power will be fed to the grid. OK, so for further information, um, you are more than welcome to go to our Phonius website, where you can download solution manuals, installation manuals, etc. You can also go to our YouTube channel. And this is where we upload each and every webinar that we do. do. So you can watch all our webinars that we've done for the Sub-Saharan African region on our YouTube channel. If you do have further questions or queries, you are more than welcome to contact one of your technical sales advisors, which are responsible for your regions, or you can also contact our international um, contact numbers. So if you have any technical questions, so this Technical question number over here. It's a very important number. This is the Phonius Tech Support Hotline. Okay. So if you ever need to call the Phonius Hotline for support, this is the number. Okay. You also got a trainings, um, contact details if you do want to find out about further trainings. Um, if you do want to purchase Phonius inverters, you can contact um, one of those details over there. Or if you want to find out about any after sales services, you can also contact one of those details over there. Okay, we will be keeping the line open for the next five minutes. So if you do have any questions, um, I do encourage you to please ask them in the question tab. But yeah, from my side, um, we hope to see you in next week's webinar. But yes, have a good day and goodbye.